We are here at the Fotokina 2012 talking to Mike Owen, European Professional Communication Manager for Canon, and Richard uh, Shepard, Senior Product Specialist for Consumer EOS. Hello. Hello. Hi. Uh, and we're going to ask you a few questions about uh, some of them about the products you, that you announced yesterday and uh, maybe a few others. Uh, basically, yesterday you introduced the project uh, 1709. Can you explain maybe in a few words about the project and who is it aimed towards? So I think uh, project 1709 is kind of the missing link between the uh, input devices we produce, our cameras, and our output devices we, we have with our, our printers. People are getting ever-growing photographic collections, split across multiple hard drives, and backed up, some of them backed up, some of them not backed up, and I'm sure we've all lost uh, a card of images in the past, or, or just our hard drives crashed. Um, and there's a, a great organize, organization job to do. It's, it's no longer in albums as it was with prints or, yeah. or shoe boxes, as, uh, as Rainer mentioned yesterday in the press conference. Um, it's, it's, it's all going online, it's all on the computer, and um, it's quite fragile. So um, with 1099, we want to really produce something that, that helps photographers look after their photos. It's, uh, it's why they take pictures in the first place. So they should be able to, to have a good, secure storage place for them. Um, but it's, it's more than that. It also sort of frees their photos because you're able to uh, get to them in, in, uh, in varying different ways. And um, we'll be developing uh, con con continually developing um, the project so that we can have automatic algorithms to classify images and, and doing some of the work that in the past you would have had to do yourself manually in, in one of the photo management softwares. How much space are people going to have in this? Uh... It's, it's still TBC uh, to oh, be okay. so determined at the moment, but um, there will be a, a number of, of pricing models that uh, work at. And, Part of the point is that it's uh, you, you don't have to use all bits of it. You uh, you can use the bits that you want, and uh, maybe you just want to keep screen mm. resolution versions of your um, mm. images in the cloud as sort of a two megapixel full HD yeah. image, um, and, and the others you keep on your secure hard drive uh, okay. at home. But it, it just gives you that option to, to store. Okay. Uh, next question. There was quite a bit of uh, delay between the announcement of the 1DX and some of the t uh, longer telephoto lenses. What actually caused this delay? Well, and obviously, when we announced uh, 1DX, we had just come off the back of the disastrous events in Japan yeah. uh, last year, and that obviously had an impact on the development schedule. One of the key things with both the long telephoto lenses and the 1DX is we had to make sure they were right. So what we did is we took the opportunity of, of the little bit of a production delay and, and getting mass production up and mm. running to spend time talking to photographers mm. to get little tweaks and little adjustments mm. put into the camera so when it launched it was a product that they wanted to see. Mm. So that was the fundamental reason why with the 1DX we had that little bit of, of, a, of a delay. And with the telephoto lenses it was a bit more of a, a, a mass production issue mm. and actually being able to get the mass production run but the quality that we needed to actually satisfy the requirements of the photographer because we didn't want to have an issue where we launch these cameras to the marketplace, we launch these lenses to the marketplace with things that the photographers weren't going to be happy about mm. because people's jobs and finances Obviously. are dependent on this equipment and yeah. that was really important that we got it right when it came to the market and I think the feedback we've had on the 1DX has been incredibly positive and has actually vilified our delay and making sure it is right from day one. This is, this is what we heard as well from ph photographers who used it. Um, yesterday you launched the 6D, the new 6D mm -hmm. that you can see on the table. Uh, can you describe maybe some of the differences between the 6D and the new 5D, uh, 5D Mark III? Well, I think um, the biggest thing to note is this is our smallest and lightest uh, full-frame digital SLR. Um, so it's actually about the same size as the EOS 60D. It's maybe a millimeter taller, fractionally, fractionally larger. Um, and is only a fraction heavier at 770 grams, um, including battery and car. Um, so that's that's really the main difference. It's really about making a product that um, overcomes some of the fears people have over the full frame. So 5D Mark III is a fantastic camera, but it's quite big and it's relatively heavy and 
course, relatively expensive. And there was this desire from our mid-range photographers, or some of our mid-range photographers, to have this, this mid-range product, which had a full-frame sensor. So if you look at our, our mid-range as it is now, we have four products in the mid-range from 60D through 6 and 7D to 5D Mark III, and it really presents sort of a, a major choice. Um, uh, you can go for full frame route, we can go for high speed, uh, and, it, and it gives it gives the customer choice in the end of the day, which is um, the right, in order to get the right tool for the job, is okay. really, really important. Who do you think is the, the target audience for, for this type of camera? Well, I think it, Really, it's a great travel camera yeah. um, because it's so um, lightweight and yeah. compact. Also, of course, it features GPS and Wi-Fi now, um, so it's, it's, it's a great camera to take on a on a travel 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 holiday with you. But then also just more general landscape and, and portrait photographers. And um, there are people who who remember the film days and and really wanted to get back into full frame, but have just been unable to due to cost and size and weight and those sorts of things so um, it's, uh, it's, a, it's a wide variety of people but it's, it's, it's aimed mostly at travel landscape. Uh, you just mentioned that this is the, your, your first uh, DSLR with GPS yeah. and Wi-Fi. Yeah. Basically the, the, our, we, are, we should expect to see these features in all of your future line of DSLRs or maybe some of the future line of uh, Canon DSLRs? I think with all our products we, we base the, the features on uh, what the customer needs and what the customer wants. Yeah. So, um, if photographers are requesting to have GPS in our products, then we will do our, our best to include in, to include them in within there. So, to say a blanket, yes, there will be GPS, is it, it's not it's not the not, not right, necessarily not for all. Yeah, not necessarily for all. But some people just don't want it, aren't, aren't interested in it. Um, it is a great feature for this camera, allowing you to tag image, uh, tag images of location data, and also quite quite a fun thing is the log that you get. Um, uh, one of our colleagues had a, had one of these products in Morocco, and you can see he'd got very lost <laughs> all, all over the place. Um, uh, but it, it's a nice memory. Yeah. You get the photos, you get where they were taken, and then you get a track of where you were. So it's, uh, it's a do, do you have a tool specific for, for Canon? So for there's a, a map utility oh, uh, okay. which comes comes free with the uh, with the camera. With the camera. Okay. Um, actually, it took quite a bit of time for these, both these features, both Wi-Fi and GPS, to, to come into DSLRs. You had them uh, before in, in compact cameras. Mm -hmm. Why did it took so long to, to introduce these features? Well, one, of the, one of the things about GPS um, is they don't like being inside metal boxes hmm. uh, because the uh, GPS yeah, signals oh, can't get in. Yeah. So, um, with the 60, we've actually produced a hybrid magnesium alloy polycarbonate oh. body. So the front and the back are right. magnesium, magnesium alloy, and then the top is a, uh, a high quality polycarbonate. Um, and the Wi Fi and GPS um, transmitters are actually right. located either side of the, of the prism. So the signals uh, can get, as get up to or come down from the satellites, um, and the Wi Fi can, yeah. wi -Fi can get out. Um, and the, the, the reason, I guess, for, for not including in, in 5D Mark III would be um, that we wanted to make it as durable as possible mm. because a lot of photographers yeah. use this as their, as their tool. It's, yeah. it's got to be robust, it's got to be um, as well sealed as possible. So it's that trade-off between uh, durability and uh, including yeah. these, in these, these features. And, of course, we have... Um, the GPE2 accessory for 5D Mark III, um, the GPE1 accessory yeah. for 1DX. Um, so there are options for... Yeah. If, if you like something, as you yeah, can yeah, use yeah. the external one. Exactly. exactly. I mean, the key thing really is when you look at the, uh, the design of the bodies, as Richard's mentioned, it's like the durability of a product like the 5D Mark III is absolutely key, and we couldn't compromise on yeah. that. And it was a request that we had to have mm. GPS and Wi-Fi in, in our yeah. pro bodies, but when we sat down and explained to the photographer as well, you have a choice. We can either make it slightly less durable by either yeah. putting a, a, a hole or something in the top that creates a seal for allow the signal yeah. out, or you have to, as we have with a 60, use a polycarbonate top panel. And, and people didn't want to make that compromise, so it's like it's a fundamental choice. And ultimately, 
a lot of our product development is down to making a specific choice at a time given a technology or a user demand. Okay. Uh, moving on to the EOSM, the new EOSM, uh, the camera basically doesn't have uh, a viewfinder. Um, an electronic viewfinder. Yeah. Um, is this something that can be added maybe in the future as an external uh, product or is it something that maybe you're thinking about for the future model of Sophie EOS M? It's, it's one of those things that we're, we're considering. I mean, obviously the, the EOS M is uh, not due to go on sale for, for another month or so, yeah. so we actually haven't got any um, direct consumer feedback on the need for, a, the, um, for an electronic viewfinder or not. Um, the point behind the EOSM is it's a, a camera for um, people who want to take great photos, but they don't want to be photographers, if you like. You know, they, they just want to have really a good camera, really good camera. Yeah. Um, and uh, it's why the EOSM is, is, is very similar to the 650D. Effectively, you take the mirror box, the prism, the autofocus sensor out, and you have an EOSM. And, uh, and as a result, it has a fantastic image quality. But the reason it's a different product is because there's this group of people who just want something very simple, yeah. something that can do everything they want it to automatically, um, thanks to seeing intelligent auto, or does have the manual control if they want to, to experiment a little bit here and there. But it's, it's so, so the choice between the reason for not having an electronic viewfinder is, I guess, one of that size, we wanted to make it as, as small, small as possible. As possible. Yeah. Um, is it technically possible to, to do it? I mean, in terms of the of the hot shoe? Of the hot shoe. Uh, in theory, in yes. theory, it could be possible. Um, but it's, uh, it's, again, it's one of these things whether we want to, to develop and something we consider. Maybe a future model, uh, we might, might do something. It's, okay. uh, it's, it's all about listening to the consumer. Because we discussed with the, a lot of people at Photokina, 2010, I mean, CSE was the big story then, yeah. and we decided to take our time, listen, and see where the market was going, and the EOS M is a result of that consumer feedback we had. And as with all our products, we'll continue to listen and we'll continue to develop products that the consumer wants to see. Um, talking about viewfinders, basically, um, currently you don't have anything which is, I would say, uh, more professional or even semi-professional with a view with an uh, electronic viewfinder. Do you think that uh, electronic viewfinders will uh, improve to the level where you can see semi-pro or even professional, fully professional cameras with electronic viewfinders? I think a question of, of whether or not people want electronic mm. viewfinders. 7D um, was our, our first camera to include a transmissive LCD screen within the viewfinder. Yeah. So it gives you that opportunity to have on-demand grids mm -hmm. and on-demand autofocus points and all that sort of information. That's something we've moved forward into our professional products. And I think there's certainly a, a level of um, mistrust, if you like, from a professional photographer yeah. um, with an electronic viewfinder. One of the we work very hard to make sure that our viewfinders give you an accurate, bright representation of what you're taking a picture of. And it's, it's the most important thing of a camera, almost, if you like, to, to be able to see what you're taking a picture of. Yeah, obviously. Um, so I think uh, it's something that maybe we will develop viewfinders in the future which have an element of electronic viewfinder on them. But I think the optical viewfinder is, yeah. is something. It's here to like, stay, basically. I think at the moment, I think the, the technology isn't quite. There, there yeah. for an e EVF type format yeah. um, for the professional. The professional still needs to have that connection. They need to have the immediacy. There's still a little bit of a shutter lag but we're behind an EVF. You, you don't get a true representation of exactly that moment. And the colours are not uh, exactly, exactly accurate. Yeah. And that for the professional photographer is absolutely sacrosanct. They have to have that connection between the subject matter, regardless of what they're shooting, yeah. whether it's wildlife, whether it's uh, sports, whether it's portrait, you need to have that ability to be connected with your subject and that I don't think at the moment you can get through an EVF. Okay. Two years ago uh, we suggested I think to you Mike uh, to integrate a focus limiter inside the camera. Uh, now we also in uh, suggested this to Nikon and Sony and actually Sony produced the camera, the A99, w with this feature built in inside. Is this something that maybe you can consider in the future or is it possible to integrate it using a firmware update to your existing line of cameras? It's one of those, th one, it's one of those points that, again, is driven very much by consumer demand. We don't 
hear a lot of mm. requirement for it from our photographers, but it's always one of the elements we have in consideration when we're looking at a new product. And we look at a new product and we go, okay, we have a list of 100 things, what can we put in, what do people want us to put in, and how are we going to implement it when we do put things into the camera. And we have to make sure that it's a seamless journey that the photographer can uh, have the ease of use, in, in, which is what the EOS system was yeah. fundamentally built on all those years ago. Uh, is it technically feasible to integrate it using film, or do you know? I don't know, but I mean, theoretically, everything's possible with firmware. Yeah. It's just a case of how we do it, how it's implemented. And obviously Canon's in quite a unique position because we do have fully electronic control mm. between our camera bodies so and our lenses. lenses. There is already data communication between yeah. the two devices. And that obviously gives us an advantage should we want to put things into lenses and camera. And actually with the new uh, three, four, five and six hundred mil lenses, mm. they're now actually firmware upgradable through the camera body as well. Mm. Okay. So we can try and add in and maintain the quality of new algorithms through these new uh, In case you will find out that people actually need this uh, feature. Okay. Um, a few questions about um, connected future. Uh, yesterday in the press conference, in Canon's press conference, you introduced the idea of a connected future for photography. Uh, what do you think about the idea of uh, a camera which uses an Android operating system, something that just came up a few months ago, a few weeks ago? I think it's, uh, it's an interesting development. Um, it's uh, uh, almost, a, for, for certain manufacturers, almost a natural progression. They have phone technology. Obviously. So it's a, a, Say headsets the way it's used the word simple, but it's a, a natural progression for them to, to um, I think from from our point of view, we are um, we, we're building cameras that are, are built for a job and, and are dedicated to being um, cameras. Um, and whilst uh, the idea of an Android-based operating system would be interesting potentially, um, we don't want to compromise the photographic the, the photo taking experience. So whilst there are, there are certain compromises you may have to make in terms of extra things you have to put in to a camera to make it an Android uh, capable camera, um, you, 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 want, you, you want to make sure that you limited those, uh, those, limited those compromises as much as possible so that you still have a fantastic camera. Um, okay. and, and we're all about extending shooting opportunities. Functionalities maybe. Functionality. Yeah. Well, we tend to do that through our camera developments and through our, through our launch at this stage. As so, always, it's one of those things, sorry, we're, we're continuing to, to, to consider the market. And, do, do you, so at this point, you don't see a reflex camera based on an Android operating system from Canon? Uh, not, in the, no, not, not in the foreseeable not, future. Not in the foreseeable future. Short future. Okay. I mean, it's, uh, it's always be something that we'll, we'll consider and investigate. Uh, Okay. Um, more generally, maybe about uh, using applications in cameras, not necessarily uh, based, uh, cameras based on Android operating system, but you did introduce the 6D with Wi-Fi, so this is a possibility. Um, do you think that the, the right approach will be uh, a more open uh, version of, uh, of the system which will allow users to introduce their applications or just, you know, maybe Canon itself to introduce applications which users can uh, add to their cameras for added functionality? I think it, it's a bit difficult to say without a camera that can do it. Yeah, like. okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, I mean, in, in general, it's, uh, we always want to get the best possible experience of the topic. So we don't want to make a camera which um, you have to be a software engineer to be able to, uh, to make work. Yeah. We want to make a camera that takes great photos and, uh, and, and potentially in the future you could, they could be extendable with other functionality. Um, and the decision about whether that's a closed system or an open system is really down to the user experience. We don't want to damage the user experience of our camera. Okay, uh, let's move on to something different. Uh, Fuji introduced a sensor which isn't based on the matrix buyer uh, um, system or arch architecture. Um, do you think that uh, maybe uh, the future for biometrics uh, for sensors is, you know, we can, we can see it right now or maybe in, in the future we will need to go somewhere else to create better sensors? I mean, sensor technology is something that is key to what we do. 
it's one of our fundamental technologies and I think one of the things that one of the elements that differentiates us from a lot of our competitors because we control all of our technology. Now with the, the R&D teams in Tokyo, I'm sure they are seeing what the future holds in terms of technology yeah. and we've, we have seen some changes in the way that the Bayer uh, system has been used over the last couple of years. You look at the C300, for example, mm. where they're actually using a debayering pattern. So they're actually, mm. whilst they have the red, green, and blue pixels, as you would normally expect, it actually reads each color for each pixel. Mm. So you're getting using an 8 megapixel uh, sensor to get a 2 megapixel it's image. A, yeah. And actually increasing the image quality, the sensitivity, and the performance mm. as a result. So it's, the technology is, is sort of developing, and it's changing, and uh, obviously, there are other ways that have been used in the past to, to try and uh, improve the, the performance of the that you can yeah. actually get from the sensor. Exactly, and uh, it's one of those areas that we will continue to study, and, and we spend a lot of time in, uh, and money uh, on our R and D procedures, and we'll continue to, to work on that. But at the moment, we're sort of seeing how we can best develop the bad pattern, as you can see through all of our new cameras, we're always about improving the image quality, so improving the pixel size, reducing the circuitry, improving my gapless micro lenses, and all of these are big technological steps that help us move forward, and, and that's really our aim, is to get the best possible image quality, yeah. and the tools that help us achieve that goal. And you actually, in, in this respect, in the sensor respect, you, you also implemented all the focus uh, um, capabilities into the sensor in, in your uh, new, new cameras. Yeah. A related question, why didn't you integrate this into the 6D, by the way? It's a, a balance between uh, cost and, and oh. performance, effectively. With this was, we wanted to make an, a, a lower cost full frame, as we, as we discussed earlier, um, and uh, the, the hybrid AF system, which is in the EOS M and the 650D, is, uh, is really necessary, if uh, vital for the EOS M, and uh, very useful to have in the 650D for, for those users. Um, uh, at this level, people tend to be manually focusing in movies for that sort of professional, professional feel. Mm. Um, so, uh, so you don't need this, the, basically. Well, we took the decision to to not include it on, on this model to keep the cost down. Um, to, to develop. Okay. Uh, is the e APS-H format of sensors dead? I don't think it's uh, dead. I, I don't think it's necessarily uh, a technology that people don't want. Again, it's one of those areas that will continue to listen to the market. And if there is a demand for crop size sensors, then Not larger crop size, sensors. Large crop yeah. size sensors, then we'll see how the market hmm. takes us. But the key uh, area for us is that we make sure that we're providing cameras that are there for the requirements of the photographer. And that's our fundamental goal. Obviously, with the 1DX, we've had the ability where we can uh, get the, the speed, 12 yeah. frames a second out of full frame sensor. And it's all about being able to get the right products to the right user at the right time. Th this was something that wasn't possible in the time that you introduced the, uh, the, the Mark IV, right? Yeah, yeah I mean, again, as, as Richard said, it's all a case of about finding that balance. And, and we didn't have the processing power within the camera oh. to be able to shoot full frame at 10 frames a second, which is why we had the 1DS Mark III, which was 21 megapixels yeah. at only 5 frames yeah. a second. Uh, because that was the limitation of processing speed it at that time. time. Yeah. Okay. Um, do you have an intention to introduce, or maybe uh, in, in future cameras, the eye control focusing system, the ECF, which was in the EOS 3, I think, the analog EOS 3? The eye control focus, again, is one of those elements that comes up in conversations when we're talking about uh, uh, new features, old features, recurring features within cameras. And um, what did we find with the eye control focus is it's something that worked well for some people and it worked incredibly badly for others. And I think the technology itself wasn't quite there, yet. there for digital technology. And, and I think the way that viewfinders are, uh, have developed over the time, I think that when you had these smaller frame sensors, you had smaller viewfinders, so therefore yeah. actually fitting the technology in would have been a limitation. But now, who knows? It's a request that comes up every now and again. It doesn't come up with every model. It doesn't come up in every research. And I think until we start to get that consistency, it's something that will probably sit in the back burner 
Um, so there, there, is, there is a future for, uh, well, for this technology. At the, at the end of the day, it's, it's about developing a feature that satisfies the need. What is the need that I control focus? Yeah. It's about making an easy way to select to, from multiple air points. Yeah. The answer is not necessarily I control focus. Okay. And it, it'd be wrong to, to, to start product development from that perspective. perspective. You, you have a problem, you work to solve it. You don't have a, have a solution and then find the problem. Yeah. So I think it's, yeah. it's just a, it's a development, a development a question. Uh, we can see the new uh, 40 millimeter uh, pancake lens on the 6D. Um, it's a very, very tiny lens, but it's a full frame lens. Yeah. It's on the 6D and it fits right in, but on the larger models like I know the 1DX, it looks a bit strange. Why it's actually a, a full frame lens rather than maybe lens for the EOS uh, M model? I think uh, the question about whether, it, whether or not it looks, looks strange <laughs> on a a 1DX or a 5D Mark III is uh, kind of not the point. Yeah, obviously. <laughs> the point is it's a small camera, well, it's, a, it's a small lens to go on a camera, uh, and it makes you a, a very compact, lightweight solution. Um, so on a 5D Mark III, it provides you with a, 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 compact, a, a more compact full-frame, uh, high-speed body. Um, the reason for making it full-frame is it allows you to go across all of our products. So um, on, a, on a full frame camera, it's uh, 40 millimeters. On APS-C, it's 70-ish. Um, it's still a reasonable, it's, it's still a good, good, yeah. good focal length for portraits and, and sort of street photography, places where you'd want a, 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 a discrete, discrete package. So it's about extending the shooting possibilities of all of our photographers, not just a, a subset of them. I mean, it's, it's an interesting lens. I mean, we were recently at Visa Paul Image, which is the largest photojournalist festival mm. in the world. And the interest we had in the 40mm pancake lens was amazing because it allows photojournalists to be more discreet in their work because they want to blend in, they want yeah. to be part of the crowd, they don't want to stand out. And be scary having, and with the long exactly, lens. Exactly, and having this small compact lens is ideal for them. And they were like, this is fantastic. They really thought it was a very, very positive step forward for Canon mm. to allow them to do their jobs a, more effectively, but e it would be also more safely because obviously safety is a huge criteria for these photographers. Yeah. Um, talking about compacting uh, systems, how were you able to actually compact the 650D into the EOS M? Basically, they're the same. The same base product. Yeah. yeah. A lot of hard work. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I mean, effectively, we 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 took apart the 650D or. In a computer model, we took apart the 650D, <laughs> looked at looked at all of the components, and optimized every single one of them to be as, as small, small as possible. Small as possible. We looked at the things that weren't necessary. We um, developed a, lens, a new lens mount, which um, is optimized for an APS-C sensor, um, so it could be smaller, allowing it to be more compact. Um, and then we just worked on miniaturizing it as, as much as possible, working with our suppliers to use smaller components, um, reducing the package size of the, of the CMOS sensor, which is something of course we're able to do because we make machines that make the sensors, um, and just work, work towards getting it as, as small as possible so you have a really portable, take everywhere camera with you that, that you can to get some great shots. Okay. Um, two years ago, I think I asked you, uh, Mike, uh, regarding the roadmap for future uh, Canon lenses. Now, at the time, I think that you said that it's not necessary because you already have a very strong line of lenses and people know what, you're, what you have and basically uh, they don't need this as much as maybe some of the new companies who are just building you know, uh, their lines, lines of lenses. Uh, now you have the EOS M, which is a new mirrorless camera, and basically it has now two new lenses, I think, for 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 itself two without lenses, an adapter. Two lenses yeah, without the adapter. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Maybe it's a good idea to introduce a roadmap so people will be able to know what's coming in in this uh, line of lenses, in this line of cameras. It's always one of those conundrums because if you uh, announce products ahead of time then do you 
potentially affect the sales of current products or even what's there. I think and, and would hope that the consumer who sees EOSM sees that we've launched and invested in this product and a new range of lenses and will have confidence that actually they're buying into the 25 years of EOS heritage. They're actually saying, okay, fine, Canon over the years has come with these lenses. Because when we actually launched the uh, original EOS 650, we only did it with a couple of lenses. So it's, it's basically the same thing, just 25 years later. Yeah, exactly. Uh, talking about the lenses for the EOS M, um, currently we have two. Should we expect a full line of lenses from ultra wide to super telephoto, or are you going to concentrate on specific areas? Of uh, it really, really comes back to this case of user demand. Yeah, it, we, we want to develop lenses that people want to use. So, um, if there are lenses that are not required, or people are happy to use the adapter, well, I mean, that's, that is a great advantage. We have over well over seventy lenses if you include. Uh, the cinema EOS yeah. range, um, which technically do fit on, uh, the, on EOS the EOS M. M. It's, it's maybe a little strange to put an 800.56 on the EOS M, <laughs> but it is possible if that's what the customers We, we have designed. images of, the, of, of, yeah. the, of this combination. Yeah. Uh, so it is possible, um, but really we're looking to develop lenses that work with the system for the users, uses that our photographers are, are putting them through. So, uh, we'll, We'll, we'll see. It's okay. the, it's the um, another question for Mike. Uh, two years ago, we talked about compact cameras, and you said that uh, there is still a future for compact cameras. Although uh, you know, mobile phones are, are uh, increasing in, the capa in their photographic capabilities. Now that you have the Nokia PureView with a 38 uh, megapixel sensor, which is fairly large for a for a cell phone, even fairly large for a compact camera. Do you still feel that uh, there is a future for uh, compact cameras? I think there, were, there is still a market out there for it. There are still consumers who are buying the product. And again, it's, it's one of our key mantras that we've, we've talked about several times today. Is it's about listening to our marketplace. And that's our key decider as to uh, what we do in, in terms of our product. So we listen to photographers, uh, we listen to consumers, and we spend time with these guys and say, okay, what do you want? Why are you using it? And we try and tailor our product offering to meet their demands. And that's our number one goal, is, is having the best photograph, the range of photographic tools that we can. Okay. Uh, two final questions from our readers. Uh, first of all, is it tech possibly technical to, well, technically possible to, <laughs> to manufacture uh, a 2x zoom uh, lens with an aperture of f2? Say 15 to 100 f2? Uh, Theoretically. Any lens is possible to manufacture if you don't worry about size, weight, and, and price. Cost. Yeah. So, I mean, we can make a 70 to 200 F2. Yeah, but it will, but be, it will be enormous and very expensive. Exactly. Yeah. And, and a, 15, a 50 to 100 millimeter F2 would be what? Very, very big, very expensive? I mean, A, it would be very large if you think about the size of the front element that we mm. have to have. Then you have the zoom mechanism that you would try and have to fit in. Then you'd have to try and have IS in there, which again would have to be big. You then have to have the drive motors in there. So all of these things would make it a, a large lens. I mean, yeah. if you have an opportunity to have a look at the 200 to 400 yeah. lens, I mean it's, that's it's quite big. a sizable yeah. lens. In fact, it's actually slightly longer than our 400 f2.8 lens in terms yeah. of its overall length. But again, it's one of those areas that. It was a demand from our users. They so wanted to see it, they wanted to use it, so therefore we try and do it. But it is always that balance of price, cost, and, and how many people will buy it at the end of the day. Okay. Uh, final question uh, regarding flashes, Canon flashes. Is there a possibility to increase the sync speed of flashes in the future? I think that's one of those theoretical questions. Um, it, it, theoretically, I mean, you can now have a high seed spin, high seed sync uh, within the, the camera, um, and it all depends on the feedback loop. Because ultimately, the cap, what well, the, well, the cap flash is doing is it's sending out a pulse, it's then reading the data, has to process the data to then get the correct act exposure, and it has to do all of this in in a very in two fiftieth yeah. of a second. Um, so obviously it's all about how we can actually speed up that process to get the best possible result. So you can use the high, sea, high speed sync mode, but again you may not get 100% in terms of accuracy. Mm. 
reduce the power. Exactly. Of course, and, it, and it's, it's also partially down to shutter technology. Of yeah. Mm. Um, to give, give you the high speed shutter um, and it fire a, pulse, a, a flash pulse. The flash pulse is so quick that you get a, a line of a line of properly exposed image. Um, so it's about a combination of shutter technology, maybe electronic shutter technology, and um, potentially increasing the duration of, a, of the flash burst, which then results in a decrease in the power of the flash. So, as Mike said, it's all about this compromise. Yeah. Of, uh, so, theoretically, yes, but technically, yeah. maybe in the future. Again, okay. it'll be one of those things we'll listen to our users and see what they come yeah, back right. with. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank Pleasure. you. Thank you.